the year of Jubilee. I think that's Luke 4. What he was really talking about was an era of grace. And we're still in it. I mean, God may well be with us in our mansions on the hill. I hope so. He may, will, may well be with us in all manner of controversial stuff. Maybe, maybe not. But the one thing we can all agree, all faiths, all ideologies, is that God is with the vulnerable and the poor. God is in the slums, in the cardboard boxes where the poor play house. God is in the silence of a mother who has infected her child with a virus that will end both their lives. God is in the cries heard under the rubble of war. God is in the debris of wasted opportunity and lives. And God is with us if we are with them. I don't know about you, but when you look at somebody that has that kind of celebrity status and is using it, to touch the poor, you can make a comparison to what Jesus came from. Talk about a celebrity. <laughs> Jesus comes from, and he says, that's where my focus is going to be. So I want us just to think about that, you know, that as we grow, that the real focus that the Lord wants us to use our lives for is to influence those that don't know him. Number two is this. Servants are motivated, motivated by serving, not status. Now, I'm going to bring this out of Matthew chapter 20. Now, I'll go through this rather quickly, but there was a mother by the name of, um, well, she had two sons, and there's, the name was the mother of Zebedee, the two sons of Zebedee. And uh, the point of this story was, is that Jesus is now seeing some things that are really taking place in his ministry. And so she sees that there's a really good thing going on, and because two of her sons are the disciples, she comes up to the Lord, and she actually kneels down before the Lord, and she says, um, I want to ask you a favor, and I ask that you would grant this to me. And he says, well, what's that? And she said, I would like one of my sons to sit on your right side, and then I'd like my other son to sit on your left side, which is really a, a statement of power. Wherever you're going to sit, I want my sons to be there at that place because I see you've got some really going, uh, good thing going on here. And Jesus goes, wait a minute. Now, friends, let me say this. It was not just about those two guys. It also goes on to say the ten others became indignant when they heard the request of the mother. And the reason why is, is because they wanted those positions. And Jesus says, guys, we've got to take a time here and we've got to talk about this. So he brings them together and he basically says this. That is not the way my kingdom works. It's not about position. It's about function. And what I want you to do is I want you to function like me. And this is where we pick it up in Matthew 20, 26. Not so with you. In other words, he's comparing it to the Gentiles who lord it over them. He says, it's not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. So here's the point that really Jesus is trying to get across. What we do in our society is this, friends. The higher we go on the ladder, the more we grab identity from what we do. I don't even know that it's impossible uh, not to do that. It's just the way that it works. It kind of goes back to Maslow and what he was saying. You know that we all have a need to climb a ladder. And sometimes, like Stephen Covey says, we recognize that we've put our ladder against the wrong wall, but we've climbed to the top, and now we're asking ourselves, what are we doing there? And Jesus is saying, guys, I don't want you to get caught in that. Now think about this. The reason why he is saying this, and I will forever preach this, is simply because he talks about, uh, John does, in this world, the world is what? Passing away. It is fading away. And so when you put your identity into a position, what's going to happen to it? It's going to pass away. When you go to a funeral... And you look at Joe in the box. You don't go up there and say, that's Joe. You say what? That's Joe's remains. Why is that? It's because we know that Joe has passed away. And when we put our identity in these things of the world, Jesus is saying that your identity is going to pass away. And here's the real point that he's making. If you want real identity in my kingdom, there's one thing that you can do to be great serve. If you serve, you're great. 
It doesn't matter what else you do. As a matter of fact, friends, when you look at this, Jesus came as a servant, and even when we get to heaven, now, a lot of people have a lot of ideas of when the marriage supper of the Lamb is, you know, going to be and all that kind of stuff. I just want to be there. (laughs) But the point of it is, is that Jesus, even at that point, is still taking the towel and putting it over his arm and is serving. And so he's called us to serve. Number three is this, not a status. Stewardship of a servant attitude is vital. Now, this is out of Mark, Mark 13. And I want to set this up for you because the way that Mark was written is because Jesus is talking about, as a matter of fact, the disciples even asked the question, what will be the sign of your return? And so Jesus goes into this incredible teaching about what all the signs will be before he returns. Now, the disciples have got it in their mind at this point that what's going to happen to Jesus is that he is going to leave. They understand that. And so he comes to this place, and he gives a little parable. And in this parable, he is saying, when I am gone, it really counts what you do. Now, friends, let me just say this to you. We're still in that time. As far as I know, Jesus left, and he has not returned. And if he hasn't returned, or if he has, we're all in big trouble. (laughs) You know, so he's saying, during this time, there's going to be some activities in my house, and I'd like to read this to you. No one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You don't know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves. Now notice this. It's like a man going away. Jesus says, I'm going away. He leaves his house. See, he leaves it. His house. We are his family. And puts his servants. Who is his servants? All of us. In charge. Each with his assigned task and tells us the one at the door to keep watch. Now, here's the point that the Lord's trying to get. Now, I want you to see this. There, there's about four points that I would like to relate uh, 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 on this point. The first one is this, that when God gives a servant responsibility, also with that responsibility goes gifting. And I, I, you know, I, we've talked about gifting in this church an awful lot. Every one of us have been given gifts. You know, I've said this, I don't know how true it is, but I think one of the questions the Lord's going to ask us when we stand before him is, what did you do with my gifts? Every one of us have gifts. And when he left, he gave his gifts, and he says, I have put you in charge over certain things in my house. Now, all of us know that have families recognize this truth, is that a family does not function unless every member is participating. And the Lord says, I have given gifts to men, not just a few, but to all of us. And so, therefore, we have responsibility. And then Jesus goes on to talk about, but when I come back, I don't want to find anybody sleeping. Now, that's really an interesting characteristic, that Jesus would say, why I'm away, that there would be the tendency within his servants to sleep. Now, here's, I want to give you some ideas of what I think what the Lord is talking about. Number one is this. When people fall asleep, Lots of times, it's simply because they don't want to assume the responsibilities that they have. So, you know, rather than take on the responsibilities, we can pretend like we were sleeping. Kind of like when we had children, and they were really young, and uh, they would cry during the night, we men would pretend that we were asleep. (laughs) A few of us recognize that one, you know. And so Jesus is saying, I don't want that kind of a sermon. As a matter of fact, I could really make you feel guilty, but I'm not going to do that because I don't think that that was the motivation of what Jesus was saying. He's just saying, look, a tendency within all of us is to think I really don't have gifts. And actually, a mentality that we deal with in this church is that it's so large, they really don't need my help. And friends, the opposite is true. The more the church builds from the inside, the more it can have impact on the outside. Every one of us have been called to do something in the church. We talked about that as ministry. Which goes to this this other thing about sleeping that I thought about. The reason why many of us will pillow our heads tonight and sleep quite soundly is because we worked hard all day. And you're wiped out. As a matter of fact, if more teenagers had jobs all day, they would sleep 
a whole lot more at night. You know? And so the idea behind this is this. Now, and this is, this is something that I think the Lord's really trying to get apart, a, a a, across to us, is this. When you work a lot, you get tired. And when you get tired over a long period of time, you neglect your responsibilities. And here's the, here's the point about the church, friends. And if we're going to be responsible about this whole idea about being good servants while he's away, is that we always have to have people in training to take our place. You know, when, when, when you leave or you don't show up and you have a responsibility around this place, the ship still has to sail. And the Lord just says, I want you to be on your guard, alert. Because there's a tendency over a long period of time just to think it really doesn't matter what I do. Which the fourth attitude that I really kind of like to talk about is this. The church is always about expanding its place to allow more people in to use their gifts. So that it keeps on going. It keeps on going. So that's a servant's heart. Is he recognizes this house that the Lord is building is really dependent upon us, we people, finding out what our giftings are and then maintaining his house. Number four is this. They have an attitude of submission. John 15, 20. Now, Jesus says this, no servant is greater than his master. Actually, there are two times in the scripture that the Lord uses this very phrase. Uh, One time is just previous to this when he's about ready to wash the disciples' feet. And he brings them together and he does this incredible act of humility by washing the disciples' feet. He knows at that time that Judas is going to be the one that betrays him. And he says, this is going to be something that I want you to do is to practice how to wash one another's feet. And so me being, you know, the top dog, as it were, I'm going to show you how to do this. And so I'm going to humble myself and do it. Now you go past this point where he does that with the uh, washing of the feet at the, at the Last Supper. And you come to this place, and he's just about ready to be crucified. And he's saying, look, guys, I'm going to tell you this. Something's going to happen to you. Is that you're going to start following me, and you're going to start finding out that people don't like what you're doing. And they're going to persecute you. And when they persecute you, remember this. A servant is not above his master. As they did it to me, so they are going to do it to you. And as I've had a right heart like it was towards Judas, so I want you to have a right heart towards those people that persecute you. Now, this is what the Lord is saying, in my opinion. You're going to go through some really difficult times. Servants go through tough times. As a matter of fact, all of us are going to find ourselves in situations where we wish we weren't going through what we're going through. As a matter of fact, I think that's exactly what the Lord was talking about, you know, that he is going to the cross. And he's going to the cross. You remember the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying for what? Strength to me. Knowing that he was coming to do this very thing, and yet he gets right to it, and it's like, this is not going to be a good day. Going to the cross. And so the point of it is, is this, is that when we come to situations in our life that we would rather opt out, Jesus says, I want you to keep an attitude of submission. Now let me tell you what I'm, I'm talking about here, friends. When I was growing up, uh, and both of my parents experienced this, and obviously I did too, they would ask me to do certain things. And uh, I would say to them, um, especially over things I didn't want to do, all right, I will do it. Remember those times, Mother? (laughs) And I'd go out and do it. Now, I did the right thing, but I did it with what? Wrong attitude. What is the Lord more interested in? You know, I always hated it when I brought home my report card because my parents didn't, you know, they did look at the grades, but what they were more important was what? My attitude. You see? And Jesus is saying, look, you're going to go through some really tough times. And what I'm far more concerned about, whether you do the right thing, is that you have the right attitude. Because if you have the right attitude, you'll do the right thing. 
And I don't know about you, friends, but every so often I need an attitude adjustment. You know, and the Lord has the ability to come along and say, I want you to maintain a servant's heart, and so we've got to adjust your attitude here. You know, this is not right. Come back in and then recognize that with the right attitude, you can endure most anything. I want the worship team to come up. And I want us to, to think about some of these things that we've talked about. It's a struggle to obey, friends. It's not an easy thing to obey. That's why I quoted the scripture earlier about in Hebrews where it says, uh, Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Is because you and I walk through this life, we're going to discover there are certain avenues that we walk down that are not going to be convenient. But Jesus says, keep an attitude that is right. And I will bless you in the end. I want you to stand with me. We're going to worship the Lord. And I'll come back and pray with you. The reason that we experience grace in our life today is because you took upon yourself the form of a servant and came and served us. And Lord, with all of our hearts, we want to learn how to serve. We want to know what it is to have a heart of a servant, regardless if it's in the church or outside of the church, that our light would so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify you. And so I ask, Lord, as we as a church gather around these next three weeks and talk about a heart of a servant, would you grant to us the ability to learn how to serve, not only you, but one another in the community that we live in. Bless us with that, I pray, Lord. And it's in your name and everyone said.